Talk about the, uh, uh, you know, calling it quits right now and, and the reason to, to step away right now. Uh, Rick, I actually started thinking about it maybe when there was a the coaching transition between Holly and Kelly. Um, and then I thought about it and knowing Kelly from her playing days and I thought I'd do it for a few more years to give her a chance to get her feet on the floor solid. And so I decided to do it. So then this July, I started thinking about it. And I told the Ball Network that I'd been thinking about it. And they said, don't tell us now, wait and you know until we get closer to the season. <clears throat> and then uh, in October, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And that kind of sealed the deal because I knew I was going to have surgery in January and miss some games. I missed two games last year because of COVID and three games this year. Uh, I've always been the top person that if, if I couldn't do them all, I don't want to do any because I never really um, liked somebody having to do my job for me. You know, Mickey, when athletes step away, uh, they, they say they're not necessarily going to miss all the wins and losses, but the relationships and the people they've met along the way, I would imagine that's the same for you. Oh, yeah. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's coaches, um, you know, particularly Pat, Holly, and, and Kelly, uh, assistant coaches, uh, the administration here back when the athletic departments were split, Joan Cronin and her staff, uh, and then all the players. And then all the fans, too, because one thing I always tried to do was to be cordial with the fans, like SEC tournament when they just dominated the attendance at SEC tournaments. If I was leaving and somebody hollered, I'd stop and talk to them, and we'd talk about Lady Ball basketball. Um, and so those are the things that I'll always cherish because there's hundreds and hundreds of them uh, that I've been able to form in my 20, 30 years. Over the years, you've had a chance to see the women's game make, make great strides. Talk about that and, and what's impressed you the most about what you've been able to watch and, and, and call out there on the floor. Well, first of all, it was Pat's vision to get it where it is today. Uh, and she was smart enough to know that if she got it to where she wanted it to be, it was going to be a lot tougher to win national championships. Um, you know, I think the days, honestly, of somebody now starting and in the next 15, 20 years, win eight or 11 championships, I don't think you're going to have that anymore. I really don't. And the reason, there's a lot of people that don't, that don't understand that. They go by rankings. They go by seeds and tournaments. They go by where the players are ranked in the recruiting class when they come in. And all that stuff you can throw out the window. Uh, you know, people talk about this year's team, you know, losing uh, to three unranked teams on the road. Well, those teams would be maybe at 25 to 30 or 25 to 35. Well, back in the 90s, they would have been in the top 20. And so that's, there's just so many good players and so many good teams. 25 spots won't hold them all. But if you still go by that 25 number, then people are going to be a little bit off on that. Mickey, do you have a sense for your, your listeners and, and the, the connection they feel to you? And, and, and how much do you, do you appreciate that? Um, well, Dan, I always tried to do one thing. And, and I'll say this, first of all, um, I was trained by one of the best, my father, um, who he was the best play-by-play -play guy that people don't know about. And uh, he always told me, he said, the only thing you have to do to be successful is just tell people three things, and that's time, score, and where the ball is. And I can remember when I started, I'd say right side, left side, you know, all that. And I remember he called me in my office and he goes, um, do you have any idea how big a college floor is? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, you need to find out. He said, it's 94 feet long, 50 feet wide. So the right side in front court is 47 by 25. He said, that's a lot of area the basketball could be in. It means a lot more if it's in the corner than it is if it's out near the half court line. And so I tried to do those three things. And at the same time, I tried to be a Lady Ball fan like they were sitting in the, the arena. You know, um, people talk a lot about how I criticize officiating. Well, fans criticize them. 
you know, you can tell and if you're in Thompson Bowling and the fans think that the officials made a bad call, you know, they moan and groan and boo and everything else. And I've always tried to be a Lady Ball fan with a microphone, you know, bringing the games to the people that are listening to it so that they could see it just like they were there. And yeah, that means a lot to me. I'll tell you this, <clears throat> I had a guy when I was in sports radio, he called one morning and, and said that he just wanted to thank me for doing the games. He appreciated me. And he said, when you do the games, he said, I can see the game. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm blind. And that said it all right there. You covered so many different events. Um, is there one, maybe it's like a little question, but a game or a memory that sticks out to you that you're going to carry on with you? Yes. Um, of course, of all the Final Fours, all the national championship games, but there's one in particular and, uh, in 96, 97 when the team was struggling and after an early exit or an exit in the semifinals against Auburn in the SEC tournament, it was their 10th loss. And I remember that they were just spiraling downhill. And I remember after they got back to Knoxville, I heard a story from multiple people that Pat told them, if you get us to the final four, I promise you we'll win it. Now, earlier that year, we lost in Norfolk, Virginia to Old Dominion. And it just so happened we made it to the final four, and in the championship game, we played Old Dominion. And I don't think Pat slept for two nights. And that game, I saw Tennessee as the most prepared basketball team that I've ever seen in my entire career. They knew exactly what they wanted to do. They knew who was gonna throw it, who was gonna catch it, who was gonna handle it. They knew everything before Old Dominion did it. And we ended up winning the national championship. And it just showed how Pat outworked everybody. And she made that promise and she kept her promise by winning the championship. Nikki, you have hosted the you know Pat Summit, Holly Warlick, and Kelly Harper shows, and you know clearly you and Kelly have some banter going on. What's that relationship with them, you know, behind the cameras, and, and what did that mean to you? Well, it all started with Pat when I think it was Kevin O'Neill, wasn't it, that started to call in show for post game after home games, and Pat decided she wanted to do that, and it was a it, it was a t it was more lighthearted. I enjoyed doing it because it showed a lighter side of her. She had a great sense of humor, and she loved to gig me. And I remember there was one time there was a, a lady that called up in the Northeast somewhere. She talked to, said, I really enjoy listening to you and, and blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. And when I said thanks and she hung up, Pat said, I didn't think we were supposed to have family members call in. <laughs> you know, just stuff like that. So. It kind of was a banner back and forth. A lot of times she'd say, you stick with the radio, I'll do the coaching, and things like that. Well, Holly was the same way. Holly and I were friends. Holly was just going through a little tougher time. She wasn't in as good of a mood as, as a lot of times what Pat was. And then Kelly, it, it basically started from the day she arrived and held her press conference. I was across the street, and uh, she comes in and sees me, and she comes over and gives me a hug, and she said, I knew you'd still be here, and it, you know it's just a, it's just how when you form friendships and not just working relationships with incredible women like that, it just it, it can't help but come across whenever we're doing shows and stuff. And then you did make this decision before the season started. Um, what did it mean to have that last season with you know, full capacity arenas to feel that atmosphere one more time? Um, well, I'll tell you. And, and I mean this in all sincerity. If I had been able to look at a crystal ball and see how this season played out and how much Kelly's had to put up with, with all the injuries and stuff like that, I might have done it another year just to make it easier for her. Um, and, but I didn't know, and I wanted to do it at the beginning of the year instead of just all of a sudden telling the ball network that I was finished. Uh, and it means a lot, but, but I didn't want it to be a season about me. And so I asked the Vol Network, they knew in October, and I asked them not to say anything about it or release it because I didn't want a farewell tour and all that stuff because most of the bands and everything that, that, that do farewell tours, they do more than one. 
Uh, and so that's why we decided to wait until this week to release it to everybody. Nikki, do you have a favorite Pat Summit story from your time Miller? Um, I can remember the time I got to stare. <laughs> um, you know, when, uh, when I first started and Mickey DeMoss was an assistant coach, from the very beginning, she called me by my last name, Deerstone, because she got tired on the bus or on the plane by, by yelling Mickey and me and DeMoss answer at the same time. So she called, she called me Deerstone. So I came in the arena one day for practice and she was there at the table. I walked up and she said, what's going on, Deerstone? And I said, not much, Summit, how are you? And she just paused and she just looked at me like that. And I said, sorry, it won't happen again. And that's the one and only time I called her by her last name. I just thought it'd be funny since she called me by her last name, but she didn't see the humor in it. Um, but there's, there's too many stories to go into. A lot of them are stories about her taking time to talk to people that she didn't know um, and it's, uh, you know, it just goes back to show that the top person she was. What do you think it'll be like, you know, right before that LSU game when you're honored in front of everybody? I'll be a basket case. Um, it's going to be tough. I mean, I'm 68 years old and I'm losing something that I've done half of my life, almost. And it's going to be tough. Already is. <laughs>